Proudly, we hail. New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army's infantry. Our story is entitled, Two Soldiers. This is the story of an encounter between two men, an encounter that was both moving and exciting, as proudly we hail the United States Army's fighting men, the combat infantry. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... High school seniors, ensure a secure, well-paying future by preparing for it now. The United States Army's Reserved for You program will guarantee you a classroom seat in an exciting Army technical career course before you enlist. You'll get top-notch training and on-the-job experience while serving side-by-side -side with America's finest young men and women. The choice is wide open, and it's all yours to make. High school graduates can take their choice from more than 100 interesting courses, everything from atomic technician to welding. The fact-filled booklet, Reserved for You, tells you all about this program. You'll learn of many other fine Army benefits, too, like regular pay increases, promotions, exciting travel assignments, and unbeatable leisure time activities. Get in on the swing. Get your free copy of Reserved for You by visiting or writing your nearest United States Army recruiting station. And now your United States Army presents the proudly we hail production, Two Soldiers. A snowy twilight, one December day in 1944. The edge of a scrub pine thicket on a Belgian hill. The sound of guns over the horizon, heralding the advance of the bulge. By the deserted road, an American soldier sits, a carbine nestled in his arms. Behind a curve in the road, another soldier, unarmed except for a pistol and two hand grenades, is walking slowly, his head bowed in thought. In a moment, these two will meet, and in that moment lie the seeds of history. But there will be no photographers there to imprint this meeting on film for posterity, to look at with awe or pride or curiosity. There will be no reporter to describe it in words for millions to ponder over. No, this is a different kind of history, the history that only those who make it remember. Yes, I remember it. I, I remember it very well. That is the voice of one of those two men who met on that snow-covered path in the Belgian countryside. It's a long way from then and there to now and here at his desk in the Pentagon office. There's a little more gray in his hair now, and there are three stars on his shoulders instead of the one he had then. Much has happened in his life, but he will never forget that chance encounter nine years ago. Isn't that so, General? Yes, because I learned something there without which no man's life is complete, even a general's. General, I wonder if you'd mind filling us in on how it came about. No, not at all. Where do you want me to start? Well, since no human event is complete in itself, maybe we ought to find out something about you, your life. For instance, your record shows that you went to West Point and finished in the top third of your class. Yes, yes. Yes, that was the class of 1918. But unfortunately, not in time for me to get overseas into combat. From there on, I suppose my record is quite similar to that of many other officers of my class. Hmm. Now, let me see. You served in the Philippines, China, and at various military posts in the United States. Yes, that's right. Yes. It was many years, but with the years, I learned a lot. And I was lucky enough to reach the grade of lieutenant colonel when the Second World War broke out. And I immediately applied for overseas duty, but my superiors had other ideas about my usefulness. 
And I spent the first two years in GHQ staff planning. Following that, I was transferred as a regimental commander to a training camp in the south for six months, and then I became an assistant commander of a division. And with it, your first star. Yes, yes. What pleased me was that I was with a division that was slated to go into combat. But my happiness was to be short-lived. One day, about a month after I had joined the division, my commanding general called me into his office. Hello, Jim. Sit down. Yes, sir. Been on the phone with Washington. They're cutting a set of orders. Well, don't tell me they've changed the plans for the division, sir. No, we'll be moving out of schedule, but you won't be with us. What? I was sure that this was to be a permanent assignment for me. Well, so did I, Jim, but I think they have something else in plan for you. Anyway, you'll be reporting to Washington on temporary duty at GHQ on the 10th of this month. I see. Well, orders are orders, and nothing can be done about it, I suppose. And you know, sir, I'd, I'd much rather stay with the outfit. Jim, I know you've always wanted to get into combat. It seems unlikely to you that you ever will, but don't feel too bad about it, because I have a hunch. It's only a hunch, mind you, but I think things will work out the way you want them to. Well, I wish I could believe that, sir, but now I... <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe not now, but later. In time. That was in the summer of 44. The way the war was going then, it looked like time was running out for me. However, my CO's hunch turned out to be right. For a few weeks after I reported to Washington, I received new orders. Orders that were to prove personally quite gratifying to me. And it was these orders, General, which started the chain of events that led you to that hill in Belgium four months later. Now, if you don't mind, sir... We'll leave you for a bit. I'd like to go about 1,000 miles to the south of Washington to a vast stainless steel modern diner located right on the beach at St. Petersburg, Florida. It was a bright, busy eating place with trim waitresses bustling about. When you open the door, there's a smell of appetizing cooking to greet you, but we're not there to eat. A few words with the cashier, and in a moment we're saying hello to a heavy-set man of about 55. Do you like my little place here? Yes, but I wouldn't call it little. <laughs> I guess not. Well, it wasn't quite like this when I bought it, right after I got discharged and started getting my pension. No, sir, it sure wasn't. But I managed to work it up to this in the five years I've had it. My army training as a mess sergeant sure came in handy. Uh, <laughs> you're not here to talk about me, right? Well, not exactly. You see, Sergeant... Well, I mean Mr. Grady. No, that's okay. Call me Sarge. Everybody <laughs> else around here does. All right, Sarge. Well, what I'd like to find out is... Something about a man named Nick Acropolis. Do you remember him? Nick? I sure do. We soldiered together during the war. Yes, I know. At Camp Atkins first, isn't that so? Sure, that's when I first met him around the beginning of 44. I was mess sergeant of Company A, 1st Battalion then, and he was transferred to us as third cook. <laughs> I'll never forget that day he reported to me in the mess hall. I was figuring out my ration count, and I didn't see him at first. Excuse, please. But you know where is uh, Sergeant Grady? I looked up and I saw him standing by the table. Little gnarled, shriveled up guy. His hat in one hand and some kind of leather bag in his other. Hey, excuse, please. But uh, are you... I'm uh, Sergeant Grady. I'm called Acropolis. The first sergeant, he told me to come here to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit down. Thank you. And I guess he told you you're going to be my third cook. Yes. According to your records, you've had some experience at it. Yes, I have a small place in Chicago. Uh, you think you can cook for 250 men? Uh, yes, yes, Sergeant. I'm very quick. Uh, well, come along with me and I'll show you around. Okay, Sergeant. And I showed him around the kitchen, telling him what his duty should be. It wasn't easy for me because he wasn't too hep on understanding America. <laughs> At least the way I spoke it. But he paid attention, and when he didn't understand something, he asked. From the little I saw him that first day, I knew that here was a guy who wanted to do good. He was eager to please, <laughs> maybe too eager. I found that out next morning when I went down to the mess hall. Good morning, Sergeant Grady. Hello, Acropolis. The egg's done? Yes, I'm all ready to serve now. You look? Mmm, they look good. Okay, open up the doors. I took a plate, filled it with eggs, and went out to the table. And I sat down... I took a fork full and I swallowed it. <laughs> you ever wonder how a flame eater feels inside? Well, I can tell you. Those scrambled eggs felt like they were on fire. I grabbed a glass of water along with the rest of the guys in the company. I hurried back to the kitchen. Hey, 
Something the matter, Sergeant. Something the matter? What did you do to those eggs? Why, I tried to make them like in the old country. I have spices here in this leather bag that I bring from Greece, and I put them in the eggs. Very good, no? Very bad, yes. Bad? You know, like... Look, Acropolis, in America, people like their eggs with nothing in them but eggs. Get it? Okay, Sergeant. Uh, you better keep a padlock on that leather bag of yours. Okay, KP, start refilling those pitches of water out there. Sergeant Brady. Yeah, did he what? Uh, keep the bag closed. Oh, that, yes. Yes, he did. Most of the time, anyway. Every once in a while, though, I'd see him start to open it. But he'd change his mind. He turned into a good cook, I can tell you that much. A little more I can tell you about him personally. You see, he was a shy, quiet guy. I guess he felt backwards about being from a foreign country and all that. Tried to bring him out of it, but well, I couldn't get close to him. It wasn't that he was distant. Well, far from it. I, I remember one night the guys in the barracks had got together. One of them had a banjo, and the other had a guitar. And when I came in, I saw Acropolis sitting on his footlocker in his room, listening and smiling. And I said, Hey, Nick, why don't you go out with the other guys? No, Sergeant. I don't understand their songs, and they don't understand my songs. Yeah, I see. Well, as long as they understand your cooking, eh, Nick? They do not understand my cooking, Sergeant. Uh, I meant, well, you know, the, the kind you're doing now. Yes, but perhaps they will someday. Someday. I'll never forget him as he sat there. It seemed to me as if he was trying to get something across, but not quite succeeding. And the light of something that happened later on, I think maybe I was right. Maybe you were, Sarge. Maybe you were. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Two Soldiers. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. High school seniors, here's an important message for you. The United States Army's Reserve for You program will guarantee you a classroom seat in an exciting Army technical career course before you enlist. You'll get top-notch training, on-the-job experience, while serving side-by-side -side with America's finest young men. The choice is wide open, and it's yours to make. High school graduates can choose from more than 100 interesting career courses that range from atomic technician through welding. A fact-filled booklet called Reserve for You tells you about the entire program. Get in on the swing. Get your free copy of Reserve for You by visiting or writing your nearest United States Army recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of Two Soldiers. An event is like a piece of sculpture. You have to look at it from as many sides as you can to grasp the true meaning. Thanks to our visit to ex-Sergeant Grady's diner in Florida, we've learned something about a soldier named Nick Acropolis, a third cook who wanted very much to understand and be understood through the only language he knew, his cooking. Now, we've also met a general who filled us in on his life up until the time he received a set of orders in the late summer of 1944. We have two dimensions, you might say, of our story so far. Now, let's try for a third. Another viewpoint is seen through the eyes of a major who was then a second lieutenant on a brand new assignment. Yes, it was a brand new assignment, but then everything was new about it. Uh, how do you mean, Major Evans? Well, when I got my orders to report to the camp, I was just a few weeks out of OCS at Fort Benning, and upon my arrival at the camp, I was surprised to see that it was practically deserted. But when I reported to the adjutant at headquarters... I was still further surprised when he told me to report at once to the commanding general. And that's when I found out that I wasn't the only one who had just received brand new orders. Come in. Lieutenant Evans reporting his orders, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Sit down, Lieutenant. Thank you, sir. Well, you tired after your trip from Benning? No, sir. Just feeling a bit of a need for a shower. <laughs> yes, of course. I'm not going to detain you very long. Matter of fact, I feel the same way. I just got in a few hours ago myself. Well, you did, sir? Yes. As of today, I am commander of a division. A division that hasn't been born yet. And as of today, you are my aide-de-camp. Aide? Why, sir, I never expected anything like that. Yes, I know. 
Aides are usually selected on the basis of more or less personal knowledge. But in my case, I decided to choose an outstanding graduate of the OCS, a new officer who's risen through the ranks, who shows promise, and you just happen to be that officer. Thank you, sir. It's quite an honor. Well, the fact is, in the spot I'm in now, I'll need the best men that I can get. As I said before, this is a new division. And as it stands now, all I have is a skeleton of a headquarters staff. But in a short time, this camp will be filled with 15,000 soldiers. 15,000 men who will have to be developed into a fighting outfit. That's a tremendous task. Yes, sir. The way the invasion's going now in Europe, the war may be over before we ever get into combat. But if it's still going on at the end of six months, we'll have a division ready to do its part. And as my aide, you'll get a bird's eye view of just how it's done. <laughs> this should be a valuable experience. It was a valuable experience, in more ways than one. And I did learn a lot. One couldn't be around the general as much as I was without learning. His keen sense of organization, his grasp of details, the loyalty that he inspired in his staff were something to watch. As far as I could see, he was a man born to lead. For he seemed to have that, that confidence in himself and his work that all leaders must have. But I could only see so far. Of course, Major Evans, then. But later... Well, later, later I could see things a little differently. But that wasn't until the division had been in existence four months. It had come along nicely. The new men had their basic training completed by then, and we were now going into that phase of training that would develop them into a smoothly functioning team. Combat problems, night maneuvers, tactical exercises. In two months more, we would be ready for anything. But anything came a little sooner than we thought. For one day late in November, the general called a sudden meeting of his staff. Gentlemen, I've just been in touch with Washington. Orders will come down in a few days calling for the immediate shipment of the division to the European theater. I know this is quite a surprise to you, but no more than it is to me. I'd much prefer to have waited until we had six months under our belts, but apparently they're intent on getting as many available troops as possible to the theater in preparation for the final big push. So we have plenty to do. Now, the first thing... As the general said, we were surprised. But I think we were also pleased that we would have a chance to get into combat. And we did get the chance, but under circumstances that we didn't expect. We reached Europe about the 1st of December and occupied frontline positions on the 14th in Belgium. Since we were a new division, we were assigned to a quiet sector, but a big one. And our line was stretched pretty thin in spots. Then on December 16th, the enemy began its final effort of the war the offensive that later became known as the Bulge, about 20 miles to the north of our position. Things were pretty much in a state of fluidity that day, and the general knew it would be only a matter of time before our division would be hit. He got on the phone, and for 24 hours straight, reorganized our positions and set up a plan of strategy to counter the offensive when it reached us. Sampson, about 1,800 potential White, Abel, and Charlie are to make contact with Paradox Red and White at coordinates as predetermined. I want you to contact all units and instruct them to hold their ground. Every man who can shoot a gun will be used. And that means every. Have you got it? Right, over and out. Lieutenant Evans, get the jeep. You and I are going to make a frontline visit. <laughs> If I may suggest, sir, it'll soon be dark. Don't you think we should be getting back to headquarters? Uh, what's that? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, uh, perhaps we should, I am. I don't know. Sir? I don't know. It shouldn't be that way. I should know. Know what, sir? The men. Are they going to be able to stand or not? Well, from what we've seen this afternoon, their morale seems pretty good. Yes, but when it starts, what, what then? Well, they're stretched thin in sections, but... You've certainly set them up to get the most from the situation. Well, perhaps. Oh, they could have used a few more weeks. I wouldn't worry, sir. I think they'll come through okay. <laughs> the confidence of youth. <laughs> oh, it's at times like this that I wish I could have... Some of that. Hey, what happened? A blowout, sir. Looks like I'm stuck in this snow drift. <laughs> You're going to need some help to get it out of here. You keep trying, I'll hike it down the road, see if I can pick up somebody to give us a push. Right, sir, but be careful. We're close to no man's land. Oh, don't worry. I'll be back soon. 
I was worried about him, all right, but not only about his safety. As he walked slowly down the road, I knew that his confidence had been shaken, that despite his position as leader of a division, he was still a human being. Yes, Major Evans, but uh, when you saw him again about an hour later, the situation was a little different, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it was. It certainly was. Now, let us backtrack a little and find out from Sergeant Grady what happened with him and his cook, Nick Acropolis. You want to see me? Oh, yeah, yeah, Nick. Uh, where's your carbine? Clean? My carbine? Oh, sure, Sarge. I'm keeping it always clean. Good. You may have to use it. Now, here's the dope. The Germans will probably be headed our way pretty soon, and our company's spread out. The CO wants every available man to take up positions in support of the front line, and that means us, too. All the cooks, the company clerks, the supply men are being assigned sectors. But who will cook, Sarge? I don't know. Just grab your carbine and some ammo. Let's go. I'll show you where your position is. Okay, Sarge. And uh, here's where you stay, Nick. Right beside this path. Okay, Sarge. Now, the CO doesn't expect much to happen here, but he's ready for anything just in case. The sign is Betty, and the countersign is Grable. Got it? Betty Grable. I got her, Sarge. And uh, you got this walkie-talkie radio in case you got something to say to headquarters. Now, I'll be up to relieve you in about an hour. Now, now, take care. I will, Sarge, and I will. And when you rode off in your truck, Sergeant Grady... You didn't know that around the bend in the path behind Nick, the general of the division was walking toward him, and that Nick, upon hearing the footsteps, jumped behind a bush and aimed his carbine in the general's direction. Betty! Huh? Uh, uh, <coughs> Grable. Advance and be recognized. Okay. Hello, soldier. Well, you're all alone here, I see. Yes, you must excuse. I not see right away you are an American soldier. My glasses, uh, half on them steam from the cold. Well, you did the right thing. Oh, you've got a walkie-talkie. Good. Uh, I'd like to make a call. Sure. Goliath calling Red Dog. Yes, this is Goliath. Send a truck over to, uh, uh... What's your position here, soldier? By this road, right here. What are the map coordinates? Coordinates? No, no. Never mind. What's your name? Nick Acropolis. I'm company cook. Oh, a cook, huh? Red Dog, send the truck to where you've assigned Acropolis your company cook. Right. I have them bring some chains for a jeep. Roger and out. <laughs> it's funny. Yes, what is? You have named Goliath. That is from the Bible. And I have named Acropolis. That is the temper. Oh, yes, yes. That, that, that is peculiar. Why you don't sit down and rest? You look very tired. I do? All right. I know what will fix you up. Some hot soup, eh? I have a little stove here just big enough to hold the canteen. And here I have tablets that make heat. Hot soup? Say, that might hit the spot at that. Okay, see? It'll only take a minute to fix up and now... And I take some things from my bag and... Well, uh, what do you have in that uh, leather bag? They're herbs and roots and spices that come from my old country, Greece. My father, he has a farm there. And he sends me these things to help me with my cooking. My father had a farm too, but... Well, that was a long time ago. He give you things like this too, huh? No, no, he gave me things, but they were different. Well, maybe not so different at that. Yeah, the soup is ready. Oh, thank you. How do you like it? It's good, huh? Mm. Ah. Yes, that's very good. Mm. That is fine. You know, you are the first soldier who says that about my old country style cooking. Yes, yes, that's okay. <laughs> Acropolis. How do you feel about sitting up here all alone with maybe the enemy soon to attack? Well, I have trained with my carbine 13 weeks. I know how to use like I know how to cook, and well, I'm not alone. My comrades are behind me there. They come if I need them. Yes, you're right. Yes, they will come. Hey, what's that? Sounds like a tank. Get behind those bushes there, quick. What we do against the tank? We do plenty. 
Give me the radio. Goliath calling Red Dog. Enemy tank approaching. Send reinforcements at, at once. Right. Over and out. We're going to try and stop that tank. Now, here's what you do. The general quickly gave his instructions to Acropolis, and they waited in the bushes right beside the road. Finally, the huge tank hove into view and came lumbering toward them. And as it drew alongside, Nick jumped out, stuck his carbine into the tread and jumped back while the general threw a grenade under its body. The tank stopped. And as the general had hoped, the tank commander threw open his turret cover to see what had happened. At that moment, the general leaped up onto the tank and covered the crew with his pistol. All right, house, and out. It was over before it had hardly begun. By the time Lieutenant Evans, who had heard the grenade, and Sergeant Grady, who had come to relieve Nick, arrived, they beheld a strange sight. A tiger tank, and before it, lined up with their hands behind their heads, the tank crew. And sitting side by side on top of the tank, the general and the cook, toasting each other with their canteens. Canteens of Acropolis style soup. General, you okay? Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant Evans. We just got ourselves a tank. We're going to take it back with us. You know the way from here? Yes, sir. Good. Lead off. Uh, we'll send a tow truck for the jeep. Nick, what in the heck? Oh, excuse me, sir. I oh, didn't... that's all right, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Grady, my mess sergeant. Oh, yes, yes. Sergeant, you've not only got a good cook on your staff, but you've got a mighty good soldier, too. I'm all set, General. Right, lead off. Oh, and Lieutenant, uh, if you've been thinking about what I said a while ago, just forget it. I've changed my mind about a lot of things. This division is going to hold its own no matter what happens. Right, Acropolis? Right, General Goliath. Well, let's go, Lieutenant. I have a lot to catch up with. As you know, the division did hold its ground and went on from there to carve out a fine record for itself under the leadership of its general. Well, there you have it. Just a small incident. One of thousands that happened in the history of our army. But an incident that will never be forgotten by two soldiers. A general and a cook. Attention high school graduates. Get on the Freedom Team today by volunteering for enlistment in the United States Army. You can help America save the peace and save freedom, too, by enlisting today. Full details at your nearest United States Army recruiting station. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Army, and this is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>